Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar today which is how to draft the perfect letter to a pension expert. My name is Mena Ruparal and I'm joined today by Mark Penston of Blue Sky Chartered Financial Planners. Hello Mark. Hello Mena. Good. I can hear you so hopefully everyone else can hear you. I'm just going to talk everybody through the software for a moment. So the attendees should see that there are five handouts that they can download. Um, not to worry if you don't immediately download them now. We're going to email them with the um, uh, after event webinar links. So there's the handout, which is a copy of the slide presentation prepared by Mark. There's a sample letter of authority that Mark recommends that people um, fill out and send to a pension expert. There's also the precedent letter of instruction that we have put up there as a Word document so people can use that. And we've got the BR19, BR20 document that everybody should have access to in any event, but I thought I'd include them today. There's a facility for people to ask questions. So there's a box on your um, controller that says questions. If you open that up and you type a question in, then I'll be able to see that and then I'll interrupt Mark at a reasonable moment and ask him the question. Um, if you don't want your name on there, don't worry about it. Don't put your name on there. I'll just read the question out. And then there's a chat facility. I've put a link to a case that we're going to discuss in there. I thought it was better to have the link and hopefully you can use the link um, to open up that case. So um, please use the question facility if there's any problems. I know a couple of people have had problems linking to the webinar today. Um, so hopefully everyone's sorted that out because I can see that most of the people who have registered are already signed up. So Mark, thank you for joining us today. These are your details. Um, and I just wanted you, first of all, I wanted to let everybody know how we know each other because um, I've been using you as a single joint expert in my pension cases for all maybe five years or more, I think. I would think I would think something like that, yes. And the first time I came across Mark, um, I read a, a, an article that he had written for the Resolution Review magazine. And I was so impressed by the fact that the article was written clearly and I understood what was going on. I contacted Mark and asked him to come over to our firm um, to do some CPD with us and talk us through some changes. Um, and I was really impressed to note that you have this Resolution logo. So could you just explain to the people who are listening what that means, Mark? Yeah, uh, I went through uh, many years ago, I think I was one of the first people who went through the resolution training, which uh, takes uh, IFAs or Chartered Financial Planners, which we'll discuss in a minute, but takes them and puts them through training in order that they can become financial neutrals, which is the term resolution use, in roundtable meetings. So uh, I can be invited in uh, at the appropriate meeting to discuss the finances and how the pension should be approached on a on a face to face basis and it's a it's a, a environment which i think is uh, proven to be very positive because there's nothing like sitting in front of people on a face to face basis and and just chatting through what a pension report means what it uh, the impact as it has um and uh, we've seen some pretty good outcomes so so you've, got involved, so you've got involved through that resolution scheme in uh, roundtable meetings, you can do collaborative law, um, we've discussed uh, using someone, your expertise in an arbitration, so it's not just writing reports that you do, is it? No, it's no, it's not. Uh, I, I, uh, it, it, it's all about certainly in the resolution resolution context, as acting as a financial neutral to discuss matters, not necessarily just to present a pension sharing report. Um, I've also used you found a training to be very useful in mediation uh, meetings, where I've been uh, either invited into a mediation meeting or the couples have approached me as part of that process. So, uh, so it's all about if you can get people in the same room, it's all about getting them in the same room and talking to them about their financial issues. Fantastic. And what's the difference then between a Chartered Financial Planner and an IFA and an actuary? Well, we'll come on to the, uh, I think one of the slides will come on to yeah. the IFA versus the okay. uh, actuary. But uh, we rebranded actually some uh, year or so ago, I think a couple of years ago, from Blue Sky Independent Financial Advisors to Blue Sky Chartered Financial Planners because our work uh, does 
uh, involve an awful lot of financial planning and I think in the past an IFA maybe has been labelled as just someone who, do, who does pensions or investments uh, and that sort of stuff and the financial planner aspect puts, puts those products or, or, or takes that client's life and puts it into context in terms of financial planning. Our, our belief uh, is that most clients who come to seek our advice do so and uh, when we ask uh, them the questions about why they've come to us, at the bottom of all those questions is one question and that is, will I run out of money? And we've got and a good slide for that to show that at the end of the presentation as to how a chartered have. financial planner deals with that. We have, and I we have, and I think, uh, uh, and and I'll talk uh, when I get to that slide. I'll talk about it in the context of how it can help divorcing couples. But the financial planning uh, title, I suppose, indicates that our thrust is more holistic uh, about looking at the uh, couple's environment, both whether they're getting divorced or not. Uh, in, in a in a much more wider picture than just specific products. So that's that's where we rebranded as financial planners. The chartered bit comes from a, a, a basically a credit system where if you have enough advisors with enough qualifications of the right level in your business, then you then you can apply for chartered status. Uh, you sign up to their code of ethics. Okay. Uh, you have to do. You have to do various levels of reporting, and and th and that's what we got. Um, that's what we got um, a few years ago. Fab. So the agenda, then, if you could talk us through that, that would be great. Yeah. Um, uh, the agenda really tries to just put some context around the letter uh, of instruction. I'm going to talk in a minute about understanding where the letter of instruction should fit in the process of of getting divorced and certainly looking at the finances. So we talk through that, we talk about what information we are looking for and how it should be gathered. We'll talk about how the joint letter of instruction should look. And, I, and I've also slipped in uh, a couple of slides, I think really from discussing with you, Mena, just, uh, just some real headline stuff on how the pension legislation has recently changed. Yeah. Um, it is a topic we do separate sessions on. Uh, because they can go much deeper than this, but you know the pension landscape has changed significantly since April. The state pension landscape's changing from next uh, uh, next April, April 16. So I'm just going to have a brief chat about that. Yeah, because that's going to really change the way that not only we ask the questions, but the advice that we're giving to our clients. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And just a reminder to people that as we go along, you can ask the questions and I'll interrupt Mark. Mark can't see the questions himself, so um, send the questions through the question box and I'll ask them at an appropriate point in time. So that gives us a good idea as to what the agenda is. Before you start on your agenda, I just wanted to go through very quickly this case of M&M, &M, which was recently reported. So for those of you who have just signed up and didn't hear me saying at the beginning, that in the chat box, you should see a link to this case. Um, it's very recent. I think it was only added to the Family Law Week judgments, um, not the weekend just gone, maybe the weekend before that. Um, and it's a really interesting case. And you may hear Mark and I refer to this case because there are some uh, interesting aspects to it. The husband um, was 70 at the time of the divorce proceedings, wife 57. So there's that big age gap between them. He's already retired and she has yet to retire. It's a 22-year marriage with one adult child. All of husband's pensions are in drawdown, so he's invested in annuities. Wife suddenly discovered at the time she issued the divorce proceedings that she has ovarian cancer. She wants pension sharing, um, and she wants to invest, she says, in drawdown pensions. So she's not going to invest her pension shares in annuities, um, and she wants them to pass with her estate. Um, she... Husband also wants a departure from equality from premarital contributions and ultimately there is a departure from equality on the CE values, which is what the judge chooses to do, look at CE values rather than income equality in this case, with 55% to husband and 45% to wife. Um, it's really, really um, an, a really very interesting case. Um, someone's just said that they can't see the link. What we'll do is we'll send the link to this case um, when, we, uh, when we send out our follow-up email 
email. So anyone who gets the follow-up email will get a link to um, this recording on YouTube and you'll get a link to this case. But it's a really interesting case. If you pop onto the Family Law Week website and look at their judgments, you'll see this very quickly. But Mark and I might refer to this case as we're going through because when we were chatting about this course, it, it because this case is quite new, um, there were a couple of things about it, particularly because the case was decided, I think, just before April. Um, but the judge did refer to this uh, desire on the part of the wife to have a pension share um, that she said wasn't going to be lost on her death. So it didn't matter if she died um, within two to ten years, which was the kind of um, the range that was put to the court, um, it, that she was just going to pass this pension on whatever she hadn't drawn down, which maybe you can explain a little bit more detail, Mark about the inheritable aspect of this? Yeah, one, one of the big changes, which I'll probably touch on again, is uh, certainly, well, in, in this case, as much as uh, the financial planning work we do with clients, is that uh, now, since April, pensions are personal pensions, are inheritable assets. Uh, whereas before there used to be some nasty tax issues if you had a pension fund beyond age 75 uh, in, in basic terms, that's been lifted. So now pensions as, as assets sit in a, if you like, an inheritance tax-free bubble uh, and they can be uh, passed on to future generations with no tax consequences. So, so, so this case, where they were evidently informed enough to realise that if uh, a, a reasonably large pension share was given to the wife, uh, she could use what she needed during her life, and then she'd be able to pass the residual element to her beneficiaries without uh, without. Uh, horrible tax consequences. Um, yeah, and, and it uh, circumvents the problems that potentially she would have had if the husband said, well, what's the point pension sharing my pensions with her? If she dies within sort of two years, then they'll be lost. Whereas that's right. that's according right. to her plan, they weren't going to be lost. So I do recommend that everybody um, has a look at that. It's not particularly, com I don't think it's a particularly complex um, judgment to read, but it's really interesting the way that they dealt with pensions. And of course, they had a single joint experts report um, and, and someone sensible guiding them. And the judge found that really useful. Yeah. So, Mark, just before we carry on with the three stages, um, there seems to be a little bit of interference coming from your end. I don't know whether you're knocking your mic, but um, maybe if I just draw that to your attention, then it won't distract people. Uh, okay. Well, if, uh, tell, all right, I'm not going to touch it again, so tell me if there's still interference. Okay. That's lovely. Thanks, Mark. So the three stages, talk us through this. Yeah, this really puts, uh, certainly from our world, puts, tries to put it in context the work we do and the three stages which we, which we deal with. The first is um, initial inquiries, and this can range from uh, us getting a letter of uh, instruction from someone we may not have, a lawyer we may not have dealt with before, uh, or somebody who hasn't picked the phone up to us. So we will get a standard uh, uh, letter of instruction or if you like letter of inquiry where someone said this is a situation can you give us a cost uh, of, of doing this report and Mena I think is going to show you this letter uh, in, in a while. Yeah. Um, quite often, and this is this is a big uh, thrust really of our, of our preference is we prefer Kate, we prefer to be able to discuss the case with you, and I think some lawyers use us quite effectively for that because you may have a case come in and you're not quite sure what direction to go in. And we do welcome the, the, the case discussions to say, I've got, you know, the clients have got this, what direction should we head in? Uh, and um, I, I, uh, I understand sometimes that you don't want to uh, produce a conflict of, uh, of being impartial, but, you know, where possible, we, sh we welcome those discussions um, because then it can really form the shape of your instruction letter uh, rather than us getting something generic. And if we get something generic, our output is likely to be quite generic and less helpful uh, if uh, less helpful than the situation if if that client's case is uh, 
described to us in a bit more detail. And at this so, point, um, I would say that solicitors tend to feel a little bit um, reticent to have a sort of a chat with a single joint expert where we know that we're not supposed to be influ influencing the expert. So it's OK to make inquiries, um, particularly if you want to inform how the single joint experts letter is going to be designed. And perhaps, Mark, we discussed the potential of, you know, arranging a short conference call with the solicitor on the other side just to have that chat and say, well, you know, this is what we're thinking about doing, or we've already agreed we're going to use you as the expert. Can we just have a chat before we send you the letter? And that that's fine with you, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, we welcome that. Um, uh, tele, um, conference calls can, can be great, uh, as can sometimes... Uh, it, if this works, um, send both clients to us, um, and uh, you know, with with each other's blessing, we uh, uh, we've had some very productive initial meetings just to say, how do you want the outcome to look, um, and that can be quite helpful for them to understand how the process works, what the consequences are. Um, so you know, I'd, uh, we love conversations about how should we approach this and what's the best way to move forwards. Okay, that's fantastic. So that's the first stage. So that's the initial inquiry stage that's there. Now that bit where you sort of slide from initial inquiry to report generation, uh, that's the bit we'll talk about in a minute. That's the main thrust of today, which is how you generate and what's the useful, what's what's the things to look for in uh, in a letter of instruction. Our work is once once. Uh, once instructed, we'll generate a report, um, typically a quality of income, offset considerations maybe, we'll, we'll discuss that a bit in a minute. And then the third part is uh, the implementation, and that would be once you've reached an agreement uh, and we've got uh, pension sharing uh, um, orders signed uh, and sealed, that's where we can help one or both clients with their future financial planning, whether that's finding a home for the pension share or just trying to look at the, both clients' situations in the context of where do we go now and how do we, how do we rebuild our retirement benefits. So it's not just a, a it, there are there are three stages here, aren't there? And you can get involved. And I know certainly for um, it, historically for some of my clients, you've produced the report and where I've acted for the recipient of the pension share with the agreement of the other party. You've then gone on and dealt with this section, the implementation section, because you you understand the basis upon the initial inquiry, the report generation, and then you do the implementation. And uh, it's it's not unheard of that we are, that we end up acting for both clients in the future, albeit separately. Uh, but that's proved to be um, well, as you say, it's a it's a joined up experience for the client. Yeah, because they don't want to keep go get the report and then go off to another um, a, another chartered financial plan or another IFA and have to explain the whole situation no. again. That can be a very boring experience, I suspect. And also, I mean, you and I have been have dealt with a case where um, somebody had had gone off to somebody who was an IFA who didn't really understand pension sharing, and then was trying to unpick the pension sharing order and saying to the client, "Well, oh, you didn't get as much as you could have done without understanding the basis for the pension share, all the rest of the settlement," and that had really caused problems in unnerving the client. So sometimes it, it is better to keep it with with the one person. Of course, if everybody agrees that that's appropriate. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. I um, I went to a seminar the other day where they uh, highlighted the fact that there there are um, lawyers who uh, do nothing other than try and sue other lawyers for uh, pension sharing matters, um, and, and I think there are some pitfalls uh, which will pro which we will touch on where. Um, You've got to be careful. You're you're not get, a not giving financial advice and b seeking advice in the right in in the right places. Uh, so yeah, that's where we're used. And also, it's quite common. I would think 20 to 30 percent of our work is to look at other actuaries' reports or other IFA's reports. Okay. Uh, and typically, the brief is we've had this. Uh, we don't really understand it. Can you tell us what's the right option? Uh, so, uh, so that's quite good work for us. 
Okay, I just want to just put, uh, bring in something here. Somebody has raised a question, and I think it's regarding this bit, which is report generation, where you've put equality of income and offsetting. Um, the person asking the question has quite rightly said, why not equality of capital? Um, we are going to come on to that when we look at some of the instructions um, that, that you've put together. But the, the person asking the question has said, case law supports that equality of income involves discrimination. And you and I have discussed this in the past, Mark, haven't we, that there are some judges who, there are some areas of the country where they just will not countenance equality of income. They just deal with equality of capital. There are some judges who think that equality of income is the right way to go. Um, and the case of m and the judge decided that equality of capital in that particular case was appropriate. And in other cases, equality of income is so although your your slide says equality of income that's not the only thing that we're going to be discussing no it's not no you're absolutely right Mena. no we will come on to that okay so hopefully so we've got here the actuary and we've got here the financial planner mark on your slide so can you talk us through that yeah um now we work uh, we work quite closely with a couple of actuaries, um, and uh, typically, and the actuary I think would would accept this that an actuary will act in the middle. They will do the number crunching f and produce a pension sharing report. Uh, and if that's all we, if if that's all we want, uh, that's absolutely fine. And um, there are some areas where in our if we're instructed to do a pension sharing report, we will use an actuary for some for some elements of it and likewise uh, the reason why we work with some actuaries is they use us but the the main point here is the financial planner can look at the holistic picture the actuary it can't give financial advice so they have to act, act within their own uh, sphere of expertise and uh, what well, or they do that very invariably very well but um, if you want a sort of uh, one-stop shop, which is a horrible expression, but um, if you if you want your report to potentially include some guidance and some financial advice considerations, then a financial planner who is experienced in a divorce world will uh, will be able to add that, uh, such as, and we might get to touch upon this, just some thoughts about you know before you. Uh, enter into uh, agreeing on a pension share, you might want to consider X, Y, and Z. You may want to consider making further contributions to this pension plan, or you may want to consider cashing in another pension plan. There's the, so so that sort of uh, that sort of financial advice can really help with with getting a deal done, uh, and it's something that. Uh, uh, that we that we can offer, or any financial authorised financial planner can do, that an actuary, I would say, can't do or shouldn't do. Because I mean, one of the things that I've experienced is this bit here, which is report generation. Lots of solicitors seem to think um, that when they you know, when I pitch up at a first directions appointment, they'll say, oh, we need an actuarial report. And I'll say, well, we need a report, but we don't necessarily need it to be an actuary um, because we could use somebody. And as you just said, a financial planner who's experienced in dealing with pensions division um, is fine as long as they've got some experience, um, because it seems to me that that there are things that, that people you know, it's, it's not just one person can do it. You can look at two two different people looking at the holistic approach. And certainly um, some of my cases, I've uh, not used you to do the report, but I've got you involved very early on um, where my client is going to need that kind of whole planning from the initial inquiry. Then when the report comes in, we can then sit down with the client and say, well, what do they want to do going forward? And then you'll implement it. So it's it's a kind of service depending on what the client wants and what you're going to need for the client, isn't it? Yes, and uh, you know sometimes we found some of our uh, the work, if you like, we enjoy most is, is or, or or we enjoy greatly is where uh, the clients may have or the solicitors may have got a pension sharing report from somewhere else, but one party. Uh, let's say it's the wife who may not, may not have dealt with the finances in the past, 
feels intimidated going into a uh, uh, an FDR meeting uh, because their level of knowledge isn't yeah. sufficient for them to be able to argue their corner. And we could, we found that we can run very effective, if you like, briefing meetings to say, look, this is the report that's been done. This is what it means. This is the terminology that's used, and this is how it works, so that they feel a bit more empowered to go in and uh, fight their corner or understand that they're not being taken to the cleaners. Um, uh, and that's really great work because it's it's really good to be able to see that you can, you know, switch the light bulb on sometimes. Yeah. Just a question before we move on then, and I was expecting somebody to, to raise this, so I, I thank the person who's raised this matter. So the person saying, is, is there not a conflict in acting as the impartial single joint expert in a case and also providing independent financial advice to the parties as then the advisor will have a financial interest in the outcome? Can you just explain how you, how you deal with that? So where you've been the single joint expert, how can you then go on and give financial advice? Yeah, I mean, that's been brought up before. In fact, when I went for my resolution training to start with, uh, the deal was, the requirements of resolution were that you could act as a financial neutral, but then you couldn't move on to help either client further from a financial planning or implementation uh, 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 point of view. Um, uh, later, and uh, there was lots. There was lots of comments, not only from IFAs about how unfair that was, but also from solicitors and clients, because uh, we view this as two separate instructions. We, as a as a business, do impartial uh, pension sharing reports, and our uh, uh, and our whole reputation um, rests on that, really. And if ever we were found to be uh, biased, I think uh, our, our business from uh, the pension sharing work would, would plummet because word travels fast and I think also the, the pension sharing work we do in the main is mathematically driven and it's very hard to fudge a sum if you like to get a convenient answer. Uh, and uh, if I have to uh, stand up in court or sit down in front of clients and solicitors and explain the report, it's very difficult to do with a fudge in. So, yeah. so you um, I, I, I've, I've, sorry, beg your pardon? You'd see it straight away. I mean, you, the, the, you, you couldn't fudge the numbers because, as you said, it's a mathematical calculation, and so you wouldn't be able to do that. Well, I, I agree, and look, we are, uh, I, I think that's a com the comment that's been raised has been raised a lot. You know, we are as probably well all financial advisors now. We're not commission based, so we're not looking for uh, uh, I don't know motivating a large pension share, which we then get to implement. It's not it's not quite like that. We're all fee based, uh, so we get a fee for the pension sharing report. There's no strings attached; they don't have to come back to us. Um, but those who feel that the relationship is there and that they trust us um, will often come back to us and say, well, could you implement this because you understand what's gone on and you know the schemes involved and you know me. So uh, we'll, we'll do either, but no, we don't feel that there's a, a conflict. So you started off by saying that Resolution's initial view was that as a financial neutral, that includes the single joint expert, you couldn't have any involvement. Has that has that moved on since that? Yeah, it has. It has. They've, they, they've, re they've removed that now. So Resolution are perfectly happy for you to, to proceed yeah. as a single joint expert. And then after you've produced the expert's report, then if the parties want to come back to you, then they can. Indeed. Absolutely. Great. So that hopefully has cleared that up. I knew that question was going to come up, so I was just waiting for it. Um, have we covered the three stages and move on to yep. the next slide? Okay. So yep. providing yep. instructions then. So this is the bit that people are worried about. Um, you prefer a single joint expert instruction, Mark? Uh, yes. Uh, if... I think it's value. I think it's the value for money here because if uh, if an individual asks for a pension sharing report to be done and then they uh, bowl up at court with this document, the other side is inevitably going to say, "Well, that's likely to be biased because it's only been instructed by one person." So we always say, "Look, if you want good value for money, try and get both sides to agree." On an expert, on an expert's report, uh, because it's going to be cheaper, and also the, it's also going, it's it's it, because it's been instructed by both both people. They've got to take it into account. 
And it's worth mentioning here, Mark, that in that case of M&M, there was a single joint experts report and the judge was um, very reliant on that report and said lots of good things about the report and the reporter. But there was also um, a, sing a, a sole experts report that was produced by the wife and the judge was not helpful about um, was not helpful about that report and said it didn't really help because it was biased for the wife in that case and had, and had only taken into account a couple of things. Well, yeah, that, and that, uh, there's two things. There is is well, if it's if it's independently instructed, of course there are going to be questions about uh, how biased it is. Uh, and secondly, it, the, the second point is different. Uh, uh, different experts or different IFAs produce reports in a different way with, in my opinion, different levels of helpfulness. So uh, we haven't seen the reports uh, you've referred to, but it might well be that the single, singly instructed report actually might not have been very well written or very helpful. And in fact, it, what was interesting in, in that um, in the decision of M and M is that I think that the single joint expert is named, um, which these days is is perfectly reasonable in judgments. Whereas the sole expert, who the judge said wasn't very helpful, um, I don't think was named. Um, so the single joint expert, as you know, is is you know their their name and reputation is going to be on the line in these reported judgments. Um, so you have to be extra careful about your um, your instructions and the reports that you provide. Yeah. Yeah. So the typical contents, um, and this goes to um, the precedent letter that Mark and I have prepared together. So just to remind people, you've got a handout section and you can download the handouts. If you're having any trouble, don't worry, we're going to send you a copy. Um, and Mark and I are perfectly happy for you to use this. I'm just going to move this over so that you can see. And this incorporates the things that Mark has put on his slide. So just to talk you through it, it's just a general introduction with the names, dates of birth of the parties. Um, Interestingly, Mark was just telling me before we went live that very few people tell him um, which court the matter is being heard in and don't tell him the case number, um, which I find interesting because Mark, as a single joint expert, has um, the right to write to the court and ask for directions from a judge. So he really does need to know the name of the court and the case number. But I imagine, Mark, you've never had to write to the court, have you? No, we haven't. No, we haven't. Our, uh, we've never been asked to or invited to. Uh, I think at the, the nearest we got to that was at where we, have on occasion, uh, get asked to uh, 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 certainly address our report to the courts, but not send it okay. to them, send it to the lawyers. So a bit of general background is fine. Um, the instruction then, the, these three paragraphs, Mark, are paragraphs that, that you've drafted that you think are kind of typical instructions. Um, so number one is to share the pensions accrued to date to create equality of income. So in circumstances where that's appropriate at the respective state retirement age. Can you just talk us through that in terms of the... the, yeah, the the, the view is there, um, you know, if we're, if we're asked to produce a uh, equality of income at age 60, not all, not all retirement benefits will have come into payment. So you'll have, if you drew it on a graph, you'd have an equality of income maybe at age 60. And then when the individuals got their state pensions, you would find that actually their, their incomes at, at 66 would suddenly not be uh, equal. So <clears throat> mathematically, and I think from a fairness point of view, the pension sharing report where equalization of income is directed, it should look at uh, the situation when all pensions have come into payment. And that normally will be uh, the, well, the last the last pension that comes into payment will be the state pension, which for many now is 66 or beyond. So, so we will do our numbers based on that. You, what, what that means is that prior to age 66, incomes may be different, but that's a contained uh, finite uh, period of time, which you can then detail to say over the period from 60 to 65 incomes will be different to the magnitude of X. So we can tell people that between 60 and 66, 
incomes will be different by X, and that can be compensated by a lump sum on on divorce to co to, to to fill that gap. But at least both parties know that from 66 onwards, the way the pensions have been divided on on benefits accrued to date uh, will be equal at 66. So, uh, and that's great. And I suppose that it, it, even if you wanted to make an adjustment between 60 and 66, if you didn't want to have a lump sum, you could have um, some form of periodical payments on a termed basis that then come to an end at 66 and then the pensions income takes over from that period. But it means that you can highlight that in your report. Um, does somebody need to ask you that question specifically because you've asked for it? equality of income or is that something that you do as a matter of course you would say well actually these benefits can be taken at 60 and therefore this period of time will be um, unequal but by far the, the most reliable thing is to look at equality at state retirement age uh, uh, or this is where sometimes we'll uh, we'll receive instructions which say create equality of income at, at retirement, and that's quite a woolly uh, phrase because uh, we can then go back and say, well, what do you mean by retirement? What age? And if they say 60, it's, well, do, do you mean when the husband or wife is 60? Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's why we would then often go back and say, can we suggest that uh, if we are considering the state pension, we look to equalise incomes when husband and wife respectively reach age, uh, age 66 or whenever their state pension age is. So just putting in, just, just if we were sending you a letter of instruction, just putting in that paragraph at number one, you would know exactly what to do. That's clear enough for you to do your reporting. That's great. That's, that's, that's near enough, yes, that's okay. good. So number two then, if husband wife wishes to retain equity in the matrimonial home or capital assets, how should the pension share be adjusted to reflect this? So you're going for equality of income, but then somebody wants to keep more capital in the home, you can then, you can then produce some, some information based on number two. This is this is the offsetting question, uh, and this is where often a bit more context helps uh, as to why there's offsetting consideration, where the money's coming from, uh, why they want it offset. Uh, that really helps us to be a bit more creative, if we if we can be, you know, from the financial planning uh, perspective. Uh, so so yeah. Go on. And number three, detail how the pension should be shared to produce projected income for husband and wife at state retirement age of X pounds per annum in today's terms. Can you explain a little bit more what that what that's for? Yeah, I think there's this this is this fits in a bit with cash flow modelling, and where I guess probably higher value. Uh, cases where you're looking to satisfy needs as much as uh, divide the assets and uh, these are cases where it's been established that the husband or wife requires a certain amount of income in in retirement to meet their needs and we can do a pension share based on based on that to say you know the most vulnerable person is the husband or wife and we need to share the pensions to ensure that this is the income they're going to get at retirement because they can't work or 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 whatever okay um, so that's fantastic. So those are the three kind of basic um, precedents that we're, we've set out there um, that people can consider that you would understand perfectly clearly um, in the instructions. Because I think you were saying when we were discussing um, putting this webinar together that sometimes you get instructions and it's clear that people don't really know what they're asking. Yeah, I think I might have used the example, which was a few years ago now, where one instruction letter, when you read through it and and read the permutations, uh, it was it was 120. They were asking for 120 different figures, uh, and uh, we had a bit of a dialogue with them, and we certainly narrowed it down. But you know, the initial feeling when we got the instruction letter was that this was uh, this was just produced, um, dare I say, with little thought. It was just, well, let's just get a pension sharing done on all these different options. And I think in a scenario like that, when the report comes out, you've got, uh, I mean, in this case, the husband had the, had the larger pension assets. So 
the uh, there was going inevitably in any scenario was going to be a share from the husband to the wife, and you can imagine that the husband would uh, just mosey down the, the the grid we've given, and he's going to look for the smallest figure. Uh, and the wife is going to look for the biggest figure, and then they're going to uh, refer across to the scenario that that relates to, and then then they're going to put their argument together based on the scenario uh, that gives them the largest or smallest share. So you know, that that is just really unhelpful. That's not that's not create that's not a fair way of dis of, of dividing stuff, and I think it skews the thinking uh, of the whole of the whole division. Of assets, so this is where we want. This is why we like talking to people because it really hones down what are you trying to achieve in this report. Uh, what would good look like? Yeah. Uh, uh, how would the, you know? You want the clients to come out feeling that you know they might not be happy about this, but they understand it and they can see that it's a, that it's been approached fairly. And I think, I've, you know, it, it's very easy to fall into that trap where your client is saying, well, what if this and what if that? And, you know, what if it's 55, 45? What if it's 57, 47? You know, and what if it's um, retiring at this age instead of that age and drawing your pensions early? There are so many questions you can ask, but actually what you need to do is sit, and sit down and think about and maybe have a um, non-prejudicial conversation, conversation with your single joint expert is to say, well, look, this is what we're trying to achieve. What's the best way of going about? About that because certainly there are times when I've instructed you Mark where I've, I've sat down and thought well if I write this letter of instruction it's going to be four or five pages and I don't know what Mark's going to come back with the problem is then if you come back with what I've asked you for is it going to be any clearer to me what the answer is and and quite often the answer is no it's not going to be any clearer to me what the answer is yeah 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 I mean less less is more isn't it in it's yeah. only in these situations I know I've got a couple of questions waiting, but I'm going to come to them in a moment. I'm just going to go through the rest of this um, precedent letter. So obviously in that instructions part, we've got three typical variations of instructions, but that's the bit where you put in what it is that you want. So try and keep that um, uh, not restricted, but try and keep it on point, I think, is the thing that's important. And that's where often I will contact you and say, well, this is the broad range of things that we've got. Um, this is what we're after. What kind of instructions should I be sending you? Um, and certainly in conjunction with the other solicitors, put that letter together. Um, the paperwork then now this is really important we're coming on to a couple of slides about this but we're saying copy of the order that appoints you details of the pensions arrangement so just a kind of table that says these are the husband's pensions this is the CE the dates that the CEs were obtained so just a sort of concise summary extracts from the party's forms e relating to pensions so that you've got the addresses and, and pensions reference numbers etc any responses to questionnaires if you've got that far and we said replies to form e and there's a note so when you download this document you'll see that there's some comments which are in the bubbles on the side we can because although there has been this ability to send pension trustees the for me since 2006, I think, Mark, you said to me earlier you've never seen one. You, you never get instructions with the form P information, or if you do, they're not helpful. Well, no, I know, and, and I've been to many presentations where they uh, where they promote Form P. Uh, in my experience, it's uh, it's of limited use to me or us uh, because in many cases it it can't ask all the questions which are relevant and necessary for us to produce a report. So in inevitably we will be writing back to the pension trustees or phoning them up to say, can they, can they tell me you know, X, Y or Z? So and I've very, certainly in this part of the world, which is Berkshire, uh, I've, um, I've, uh, I can't remember the last time I saw a Form P. And it's interesting because some of the places that I, I teach um, match around your finance, they will tell me, and I think Southampton's one of them that springs to mind, that they always complete the for me. So it's part of their, their usual checklist of things to do. And I know in the case of the Court of Appeal case of Martin Dye and Martin Dye, they said that it would be usual to complete the form P. The family procedure rules of 2010 say that the court at the first directions appointment has the right to direct the parties to complete the form P. But again, it's not something that I would say is usual. 
Oh, many. Just, just to clarify. I think I heard you say form E once. Form you, P. We are talking. We are talking, talking about form P, form aren't P. we? Yeah, we're talking about the form yep. P. Yeah. Yep. Um, so that's number five. So if you've got the form P, then fine, send it. But don't go out of your way to get it because you don't necessarily find it all that useful. No. And then. Number six and seven. So the BR19 is not a mandatory document that you need to file with the form E, but it can be useful. And you're going to show us um, in one of the slides a uh, sort of current form uh, BR19 state pension forecast that's being produced at the moment. Yes. And the BR20, and a lot of people don't fill this in, and it is a document that's mandatory to complete and fill in the information with the form E. Can you just give us a summary of what that is? Well, uh, it's all going to change, really, but the form, uh, the BR20 values additional state pension benefits, so it's not, doesn't value the basic state pension, it values the extra bits which some people get. Uh, and uh, the basic state pension, as many of you will know, isn't shareable. Uh, in the same way that uh, the additional state pension benefits are. So there are instances where we uh, would look at sharing the additional state pension elements and uh, in order to do that you need to know the valuation which is where the BR20 comes. And it's I've just probably... got, yeah, I've downloaded the BR19 and the 20 as part of the handouts, just in case um, people don't have them handy. It's worthwhile just um, printing those off and, and using them and getting people to fill it, fill them in as soon as possible. Because sometimes it can take six weeks to get them done, and sometimes it, they can turn them around within 10 days, can't they? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think the only additional thing to be said is the form BR20 uh, will be going very shortly. Well, we'll, we'll be going next year. Okay. And we're going to come on to that when we look at changes. So um, the rest of the report is basically about your duties, which um, can be found in Practice Direction 25B. I generally don't send that to you, Mark, because I know that you know what you're doing um, and that you don't need an additional copy of the Practice Direction. Um, I don't object to people sending them out to single joint experts as a matter of course. But really, if you need to, uh, my view is if you need to remind the expert of what their duties are, then they're probably not an expert. You know, somebody who who's holding themselves out as a single joint expert should know all of these things. So I do put in a bit of information about the statement of truth and, and where the report is going um, and ask the, you know, just as a reminder to ask a single joint expert where to send things, but I don't tend to go into too much detail. So um, obviously these are all precedents that you can alter and amend as you please. The timetable then is pretty straightforward. You need to know what needs to be filed where and by what date. It's just worth mentioning that you like to know a kind of realistic timetable. So paragraphs two and three say this is the date that the court needs you to file it, but actually there might be some room for slippage because the next hearing isn't until kind of four or five months down the line maybe. Um, but if you can't file the report on time, we need to make alternative arrangements. And then there's some some a couple of paragraphs here about asking you questions and providing replies and the costs of that because it's something that I think that people don't really pay that much attention to and it may be that there are you know if you've asked for 20 different calculations people are invariably going to have to ask you for clarification on those so I mean, it's something that I recommend that you allow time for because it's kind of 10 days to ask the questions 10 days at least to answer the questions. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, I would I have to agree with all of that, Amela. <laughs> and the fees at the end. So I'm not going to read out the whole letter. It's there for you to download. If you have questions, please ask them. Even after the event, we have a, a LinkedIn group where we are going to start a discussion. We send you a link to that. So if there are any discussions after the event, even for people who are watching this on YouTube, you can just go to the LinkedIn discussion group and um, Mark will be included in the discussion. So if you've got questions, you can um, do that on that forum or even contact Mark directly. Um, but uh, we've got his email address and other details at the end of the slides. So we'll move on then, if you don't mind, to collecting the data, Mark, because I know that you've said that you prefer to collate a lot of the data yourself. Uh, yeah, in, invariably, I let, uh, I'm just looking at the time manner. I don't know. Uh, this is an hour session, isn't it? Yeah, we've got <laughs> ten minutes left. We'll we'll move right, so, forward. So, so, so yeah, whizzing through, collecting the data. Look, we'd much rather do this ourselves because uh, I've yet to get uh, a bundle sent to me where there's everything we need. So, uh, by all means, send us what you've got. 
but send us letters of uh, uh, letters of authority for each case, for each pension that you want us to consider. We whiz those off straight away so that it means if you haven't provided us with all the information we want, we can get it. We can get it over the phone or we can right away and get it, but that's really important. So one of the questions I think that ties in with that is somebody who's just saying, oh, don't you really need to have a completed Form P so that you know whether or not the pension arrangement is subject to prior attachment, sharing, or is, if it's underfunded? Um, part of your collecting data would be that you would ask those questions directly when you get your letter of authority, sample of which is in the handout. Yes, uh, that's absolutely right. We ask all that stuff anyway, and a number of times uh, that I've heard, although we haven't seen them, of Form P's apparently are often returned uncompleted uh, or with sections missing. So uh, I'm, those those points are relevant, but there's many more pop points, mathematical points, often and figure issues which we need to ask about, which we're going to have to contact them with anyway. Okay, so that's why you want you prefer to have your letter of authority so you can contact the, yeah. the schemes. I mean, the more the better. So I'm not saying if, if people start filling out form P's, that's that's fantastic. But uh, we work we work our way through that even without a form P. I think we've covered these providing clarities when we were looking at the letter of instruction when we're looking at producing a quality of income at retirement. So when is retirement? Um, the second one is producing equality of income at retirement considering pensions accrued during the marriage only. We didn't cover that. So that's where somebody is looking at pre-marital or post-marital um, contributions that they want to take into account to depart away from equality, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's a bit of a nightmare, I think, to any uh, to, to any uh, instructed expert, because if uh, if you if the marriage was I don't know ten years ago, uh, we need to know. Well, okay, you want us to consider a pension accrual only during marriage. So how much had you accrued uh, when you got married? And and very few people have pension statements or valuations from 10 years ago. So that normally uh, entails us gleaning what information we can and making assumptions uh, as to uh, what we think might have been the accrued pension at the date of marriage. So. Uh, I understand why it's done, uh, it's just a warning that it's not very easy to do. And it's worth mentioning again, in the case of m and the husband um, wanted his premarital pension contributions to be taken into account because the party's married at 42. And the way the judge did it I, uh, is the parties had agreed that 80% of the pension had accrued during the period of the marriage. And then he said, well, you know, I could take into account a reduction of 20%. I could take into account a reduction of nothing because it was a long marriage. And he kind of, you know, stuck his finger in the air and said, well, this seems fair to me in this case. And that's not unusual usual is it mark no 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 it's not um that's sometimes the frustration we have that our pension sharing reports will generally work to two decimal places and then a then then a judge will uh, uh drive an axe through it and say well yeah but it feels my gut feeling is it doesn't feel like that it feels like something else so that's uh, the broad brush basis that the courts like to use yeah yeah but might be inaccurate <clears throat> So offsetting we discussed when we were looking at the letter of instruction and sharing the funds equally, which is something that somebody mentioned earlier, is is that not fairer? Uh, no, shall we shall we move on to the next slide? Because this answers it really. This yep. shows the this shows the dangers. Now this first this first grid uh, uh, for those of you who know David Lockett, actuaries for lawyers, uh, uh, David produced this, um, which is uh, the most extreme version uh, of of uh, of the problems caused by a 50/50 pension share that we could find. Uh, and if you check our website out in a few days, we're currently working on a note. Uh, that explains this in, in uh, I was going to say in English, it's very difficult to quite get there, but I hope it's going to make some sense. So look at this, you know, if you had said, oh, we're going to divide a CE 50-50, uh, the consequence of that would have been these incomes. Now, if you do that and the clients find out what their income is, I suspect some of them, one of them in particular, might be a bit grumpy. And, uh, and that that's, that's one reason. If we move on to the other one, which is a simple, more simple uh, money purchase scheme, pot of money, which normally would have uh, unisex annuity rates 
uh, apply to it. So normally money purchase pots can be divided down the middle. What if this money purchase scheme has a guaranteed annuity applied to it, which, which lots of them still do, but aren't necessarily immediately apparent? A 50-50 share in this instance can still produce a massive difference in income. And it is our view that pensions are there in the main to provide uh, a, an income in retirement. And therefore, the only really fair way of dividing them is with some due regard to the income that those pensions will produce. Because pensions are there to provide money in retirement for the rest of your life and, and uh, make sure that you, making sure that hopefully you won't run out of money. These, two, these, these are just two examples of what can happen if you divide the C by 50-50. I don't really support that. And it's worth mentioning, um, as the person who asked the first question said, is that, that there are some judges, and I think Nicholas Mostyn has recently um, said that he doesn't see any reason why you can't just divide CEs 50-50. Well, here are two very good examples as to why not. Um, and Absolutely. there are some judges that just won't allow pensions reports on an SJE basis to be prepared um, because they don't see the point because CEs are you know, perfectly reliable. So I think people are just going to fall into two different camps, aren't they? But this is a sort of word of warning as to as to why difficulties can or how difficulties can arise. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, these yeah, it, it's um, yeah. Make make your make your choice, but in this instance, uh, I don't think it's it's defendable. And I think if people understand the consequences, they may change their mind. So, just a word of warning: we might go over. Mark, are you are you okay to go over for five or ten minutes? Yeah, I am. Um, okay. Yeah, so I am. What I'll do is, if people can't continue on beyond two o'clock, you're going to get a link to the um, to the webinar anyway, so you can um, watch the bits that you've missed if you can't stay with us. But I think it's worthwhile carrying on, even if we do go a few minutes over. Yeah, let's so, uh, let's get on. Notes of notes on instruction of wording. Oh, sorry, Mark. Um, the um, knowing your clients and their objectives enables clear instructions to be given. Um, so. That's what you were saying about getting getting to know people and getting to know what people are after at the beginning, um, yeah. and requesting too many per permutations is costly and unhelpful. So we that goes yeah. along with the single joint experts letter. Talk us through what this is, Mark. Well, this is just a, a fairly poor quality um, a snapshot of, of what our reports look like. They look at our, our function. Our, I suppose our experience is, is that when people get the, gets the, get these reports, they're either time precious judges, lawyers, or clients, and uh, and they just want to get to the grid and say, well, look, tell me. I've asked the question. What's the answer? So we do prior and present our findings in a uh, very uh, reader-friendly format you'll find uh, we'll have grids which are as simple as possible and the supporting text and if people want to go very deep into the rationale etc we uh, we add all that text in there so you can you can get to the rationale uh, if if you want um, but uh, it, that's what I'm, you know, we, we write reports to our clients every day on all forms of financial planning. Our intention is always to make our reports as digestible and understandable for our clients. So this, this follows suit really. And so this is the bit of your report that I forward, fast forward to, have a look at the tables and then I go back and read what you've said. That's right. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, and then the state benefits, you're just going to talk us through what the changes are going to be from next year. Yep. Uh, headlines only, um, and that is that uh, the, the state pension is changing uh, from next April. Uh, the key points are you're going to need more years to qualify for a full pension than you used to. It used to be 30. If you qualify for the full pension, the current uh, weekly pension, uh, full weekly state pension is £152 uh, a week, more than it is currently, but we'll come on to that. Uh, pension substitution, which is where in the past, uh, a uh, let's say a wife could ask her national insurance record to be elevated to that of her husband's if her husband's was greater. Uh, that's called substitution, and, it's, and it won't be any longer... Uh, uh, available. Um, and that's retrospective, and, isn't it? And that's for clients 
they're, t they're sort of switching that off and they're saying that if you haven't already got your state pension then you you won't be able to to Indeed. do substitution that's right, uh, which is a bit worrying because, of course, there are some reports which have been done, probably many reports which have been done on that basis, that the basic state pension will be equalised. Well, that isn't going to be the case anymore. Um, as a small techie point that uh, pensions aren't going to be, even, even the, additional benefit, well, the additional benefits don't exist as from April. Uh, there are some... Uh, some scenarios where some sharing is possible, uh, it's a bit more technical, uh, we won't go into it now, but there are sometimes elements which are shareable, but much less than there ever were. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, so I think... That, this is the new so, BR19, isn't it? Yeah, so this is what it looks like, uh, and I think I said the uh, the maximum weekly pension is £152 a week um, and in this in this case the individual's existing state pension had accrued to £140 uh, a week uh, and his new state pension which of course is meant to be uh, better uh, is only, oh, what's that say, Not, uh, £87, 87 pounds a yeah. week. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's again uh, dark and uh, uh, dark and dreary the reasons why but essentially this individual has uh, qualified for a uh, full uh, s uh, state pension in the new regime but there are deductions made from it for his contracting out period okay. so in this in this instance he might think well the new state pension rules will give me a better income they won't actually he will be relying on his existing state pension rules which are the rules at the moment that if but whichever is the higher you will benefit from. Okay. But the, this is the output of the BR19s, by the way. Okay. So that's what we're going to get now if we get if we fill in the BR19 and get that information. Yes. So from April 2015, these are the new. This is this is personal pension rules. Very quickly, personal pension rules uh, change from this April. Uh, retirement age is still the same at 55, uh, although that will be increasing uh, in due course. Uh, uh, you can, from money purchase schemes, these are the pots of money uh, that are individually owned. You can still get 25% as tax-free cash. You can, but you can have access to it all. Uh, the thing that you need to be aware of is that the other 75% of the pension pot will be added to your income and uh, we've heard of uh, quite a few examples where people have said happy days now's the time to get all my money out of my pension and suddenly found for that year in question they were 55% taxpayers because of this big lump of pension money that uh, that they benefited from so uh, nonetheless, some great scenarios can be created where you can get additional lumps of money from your pension. Yeah. Uh, we've mentioned before, so I won't dwell on it, there are great improvements uh, to the tax on death and an inheritance tax from an inheritax point of view. Uh, it's just given us more options with our clients to think about creative ways of uh, taking retirement income. Thank you. Um, and uh, it's worth mentioning again the case of M&M, &M, which is what the wife said she was going to do in the circumstances where she got a pension share. That's right. So some of the consequences, Mark. Uh, is this the consequences of the uh, personal pension uh, uh, legislation uh, that I've just referred to? Uh, again, the headlines were great news, you don't have to buy an annuity. Um, I'm, I'm not fully supportive of that. I'm supportive of, uh, of some of the flexibilities, but I think for some people, annuities are still entirely relevant and appropriate, even though uh, with the admission that rates aren't as good as they were. Um, and uh, as we've discussed before, pensions are now inheritable assets, so, uh, so from a financial point of view, uh, often we're now recommending they're the last fund to access. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the only other thing worthwhile mentioning there is, is uh, we haven't done final salary pension transfers, uh, or very rarely have we done them recently. But now, with this change in legislation, the question of is it worthwhile me transferring out of my final salary pension scheme has uh, reared its head again and there are some great uh, examples. Uh, I'll give you one very brief example of a client we recently saw and um, 
it, it was the husband who was desperate to retain the uh, family matrimonial home because he knew that if he could retain the home, his children would stay living with him rather than going off and living on their own or with a mother. So his overriding uh, uh, desire was to find a way of buying his wife out of, uh, out of the house. And he frankly didn't have the mortgage capacity and he didn't have enough savings and the only thing he could do was look at uh, transferring his uh, personal pension uh, which was with BA if I, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, his view was, well look, uh, I'm 65, I'm not going to I'm not going to worry about losing a spouse's benefit if I if I transfer from BA. So what we're currently looking at is the benefits and uh, the cons of transferring his BA uh, final salary pension scheme to a personal pension so that he can get a lump sum out and also uh, some more funds uh, beyond the 25% so that he can buy his wife out of the home. Okay. Now it doesn't doesn't create a great, you know. You then have to think about well, how you're going to rebuild your retirement income, etc. But his number one priority uh, was that, and uh, creates some interesting scenarios to consider. I've got a question about final salary pensions, Mark. So, how would you deal in an, a single joint expert report with a common difficulty where the pensioner has a final salary pension? but there has to be an external pension credit, which might require a transfer of over 50% to enable the recipient to secure similar income, including index linking. So the person who's asking the question says, in such situations, the person with pension credit may be able to access the pension at 55, but the pensioner may have to wait until 60 or 65, so some rebalancing might be needed. How do you deal with that? Well, uh, this is a danger really because you can enter into a million and one permutations and quite simply if you establish with the clients that it's reasonable that they won't retire until let's say state retirement age, yeah. uh, I would suggest that those reports are still done with the state retirement age uh, uh, figure uh, or age uh, as the date at which we create our reports because up until then, the clients can do whatever they want, and uh, if it's a final salary scheme, the chances are they'll be able to access their benefits early, albeit with uh, a fairly hefty actuarial reduction, but uh, someone could also take their benefits early from a, final, from a money purchase scheme. So I think that's a little bit of uh, a red herring really because what you really want to say is, well look, you can do what you like once the pension share has happened, but we'll divide them now with the view to, for want of a better expression, you being you know, responsible or a normal, you know, a normal person who would use your retirement benefits uh, to produce uh, an income for you at state retirement age because that's the function of a pension. So it's the question that you're asking rather than as the person who asked the question, the rebalancing. It's about asking the question in the first place in, in the instructions about state retirement ages and equalising at that point. I still think I still think it's a good rationale where you get into those debates and they often happen, you know, but I'm going to retire early. Well, of course, you'd say that because it's in your favour yeah. and all that sort of stuff. I still think the backstop is, look, let's look how you divide the pensions uh, at state retirement age and you can do what you want before then but that's your choice. Okay. Thank you. So changes in valuations, moving target syndrome which I think is really important if we can cover that. Yeah, well we're near the end now so oh. Uh, oh. Yeah, I'll go back. Uh, yeah, this very briefly is, you know, we will get a uh, CE today and uh, do our report on that basis and then uh, and then it may not be implemented until many months uh, down the line. And the point here is when the trustees get a pension sharing order and decree absolute and all the necessary paperwork, they then enter into an implementation period which is four months. And in those four months, they will revalue the pension. So although they've provided us with a uh, although they've provided us with a valuation now, they're going to revalue it in the future at some stage. 
So we need to tell our clients that this is going to happen so that they're not expecting a specific sum. Yes, that's that's right. And, uh, uh, and, and what we've seen is sometimes some really significant movements in the CEs from one, the day when we received them to actually when they've been implemented. And and some we've we've spot we have had several mistakes actually which have been which have been made, but sometimes there is a movement in the uh, CE just because it's been recalculated um, based on market conditions at that at that time. And I think the only thing you can do really is to say to the client, look, this is the this is the situation now. Uh, and, but it might change, so be prepared for uh, there to be some movement in your CE. Um, as I say, we challenge anomalies, and we had we had one case which I thought worked really well, where we talked to the clients about this possibility, and they said, "Well, look, we've got enough money. Let's set aside a pot of money, which is used for the the balancing of any differences." Once the pension shares happened, yeah. and it was it was agreed in the consent order that this fund would be set aside, and I would then redo the pension sharing calculations once they'd been implemented, and there was a balancing payment for, to allow for this movement. Are you able to give somebody's asking a kind of ballpark figure for the cost of implementation of a pension sharing order? Uh, it, uh, it can either be on a fixed fee basis. Um, or if a client engages with us from a financial planning perspective, then uh, our fees will be a percentage of the fund uh, because we're then involved in the uh, investment and financial planning uh, for that client. And that, uh, depending on the size of fund, uh, the implementation cost can be 1% or 2%. Uh, uh, or we can work on a fixed fee basis, whichever I think we feel is most appropriate for the client. Great, thank you. So this is the, the, the sort of graph that we were talking about, cash flow planning. I don't think we've got too much time to go into this, but this is the work of the chartered financial planner, isn't it, to see how much money you've got now and how much money you're going to have in the future, and the red bits are the shortfall, aren't they, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I mean, very briefly, we've got a piece of software. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not the only IFA who's got this software. Um, but we put a client's life into the front end of this, including for a divorce client when their maintenance payments might end, or or when their kids might leave university, and all that sort of stuff. So it works for divorced people as well as uh, non-divorcing people, our standard clients. And it will say, look, in this instance, I think it's about 75. At 75, based on what you've told. Told us you want to you want to spend you're going to run out of money yeah. so we've now got to look at rejigging your finances to try and make sure that there isn't any red and that you don't run out of money and that and that's what cash flow planning is all about lovely so this is the final slide which is about your services while people have a look at that I've answered all the questions I'm going to uh, I'm going to launch a poll um, just to ask people if they don't mind just to answer these questions about when your firm is going to move over to the new CPD scheme. So if you wouldn't mind just voting on the poll, that would be fantastic. Um, the options are before the 1st of November, so that's when the next CPD year starts, or before the 1st of November 2016, which is actually when the new scheme becomes mandatory, whether your firm's planning on moving over to the new scheme then. Uh, after the 1st of November, well, most firms are going to go. And uh, I added in a new question, which is what new scheme? Um, if you don't know about the new scheme, then do have a look at the website for Law CPD Solutions, because we explain what the new scheme is and what your firms are going to have to do from a compliance perspective. Um, and and it, you know, it's it's important to um, to know what's happening and to have a look at that. So I'm going to close the poll. Um, most people, 22% are, oh, are sort of saying they're going to wait until um, after the new scheme becomes mandatory, which isn't surprising. So thank you very much, Mark. Again, I've put up your contact details. So if anybody has any uh, additional questions to ask you, they can contact you um, at your email address, which is there on the screen at the moment if anybody has any questions oh, yeah. for me um, those are my details uh, again we're going to be sending out all the handouts and a recording after the session so thank you very much for everybody who stuck with us most people have stayed the extra 15 minutes thank you mark for your time and for being able to spend the additional time answering questions
Pleasure. Thank you. So um, we'll end the uh, recording and hopefully everybody will get the um, recording and the webinar handouts and the link to the um, case that we mentioned within the next hour. Thanks very much. Bye.